May 21st, 2002. A warm spring day in Peachtree City, Georgia. 44-year-old Kathy Bush spends the morning with her husband, Craig, and their two sons, Jason and Matt. Oh. It looks like any other happy family scene, but a cloud hangs over the house. In less than three weeks, Kathy will be taken to Gadsden Correctional Institute, where she will begin serving a five-year sentence for child abuse. Back in the fall of 1999, a jury concluded that she had systematically kept her daughter Jennifer ill for more than eight years. Yet Kathy Bush claims she did nothing wrong, and she, her family, and her supporters believe she will be vindicated. I am still praying for a miracle. My family depends on me. I'm just a mom, and I'm afraid for my family. I just can't imagine my life not being a part of their life every day. To many, however, Kathy Bush is a deceptive and dangerous woman. A mother who in time would have killed her daughter had the state not stepped in. This child has suffered through numerous unnecessary surgical procedures and pain and suffering, unlike anything I've ever seen in my 14 years as a prosecutor. Even today, after more than a decade of questions and controversy, the debate still rages. Was it the daughter who was sick? Or was it the mother? In 1985, Craig and Kathy Bush moved with their two sons from Atlanta to this house in the affluent Fort Lauderdale suburb of Coral Springs. Craig was a car salesman. Kathy, a manager at a credit card collection company. The couple had been married for nine years. Our dreams was to have a long life together, raise a family. On May 22nd, 1987, Kathy gave birth to a third child, a girl they named Jennifer. She was a dream come true. From the time I was a child, I dreamed of having a little girl that I would name Jennifer. And she was everything I could ever hope and, and dream of. At first, Jennifer was a happy, healthy baby. But her mother soon began reporting that she suffered from severe respiratory and ear infections and chronic diarrhea. Doctors determined the cause to be a rare immune deficiency disorder. When Jennifer was still an infant, a semi-permanent IV line was implanted in her chest because her veins couldn't withstand shots that doctors had to give her. And that's where we began. Um, you know, following the advice of the physicians that this is what had to be done to keep Jennifer alive. With Jennifer constantly ill, Kathy immersed herself in the language and procedures of her daughter's care. In the process, she grew close to Jennifer's pediatrician and in 1988 quit her job to become his office manager. As Kathy might have predicted, the switch cost her daughter's health insurance. Because Jennifer had a pre-existing condition, she did not qualify for new coverage. But it also gave Kathy remarkable access to Jennifer's medical care. I had access to Jennifer's records as I did every patient that was seen in that office. My interests lie in medicine and keeping my daughter alive and being an informed parent. Over the next two years, Jennifer's health only seemed to get worse. Kathy reported to doctors that Jennifer was experiencing seizures, severe abdominal pain, and problems keeping food down. In 1990, as a last resort, Doctors decided to implant a pair of feeding tubes into her intestines. She would now receive most of her nutrition through these tubes. Jennifer never complained. She was very accepting that this is what she had to deal with, and um, she, she handled it like a trooper. She's probably the most outgoing little girl that, that uh, I knew of, you know, despite all of her problems and stuff. She was always either dancing or, uh, or playing with friends, or she loved to fish and, and ride her little uh, bike or her Barbie Jeep. Jennifer never complained about going off in the mall or to dancing with her apparatuses or a backpack or tubes showing through her bathing suit. And she just said she was just a, a gift from God, and this is what she has to deal with. But as Jennifer's problems mounted, so did the cost of taking care of her. 
The Bushes made too much money to qualify for Medicaid, yet their two incomes were nowhere near enough to pay the bills, which by the early 90s totaled in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Hearing of their plight, a local charity formed Friends of Jennifer to raise money for her treatment and enlisted the media to help in the cause. Spirited and sweet, Jennifer was the perfect symbol, the innocent victim of a heartless health care system. She became a celebrity. She became known locally. There were stories in the newspaper saying, here's this poor little girl and she's very sick and her family needs money for care. Through it all, Jennifer's mother was by her side, the super mom, willing to make any sacrifice for the sake of her daughter. But at Coral Springs Medical Center, where Jennifer was a patient, there were already those who saw things very differently. In the spring of 1991, hospital administrators quietly began investigating that Kathy Bush was deliberately making her daughter ill. Dr. Eli Neuberger, a pediatrician and expert on child abuse at Harvard Medical School, was brought in to review Jennifer's files. As I looked at this record early on, there were smoking guns all over the place. Intravenous pumps that were tampered with, misrepresentations made about seizures, about fevers, about laboratory findings, about physicians' diagnoses. Mothers constantly asking for more tests and more intrusive treatments that she could be involved with herself. But later that summer, the Bush family turned around and sued the hospital. By January of 1992, the investigation was closed and no further action was taken. During the next few years, Jennifer's condition fluctuated constantly. By her seventh birthday, she had been hospitalized over 150 times and had undergone more than 30 operations, including the removal of her gallbladder, appendix, and parts of her intestines. She and her mother had by this time grown accustomed to the media spotlight, and Kathy had become a vocal advocate for health care reform. Four years ago, our family's insurance company dropped Jennifer from their roles. In the summer of 1994, mother and daughter traveled to a rally in Washington, D.C., where Jennifer read a poignant letter to First Lady Hillary Clinton. I am giving you also this T-shirt so when you go jogging, you can, you can wear it. When we actually went to Washington, she was very excited. She felt as though she was helping other people. She felt that she was pretty important and pretty special. Less than a year later, Jennifer again made headlines. This time, it was the Florida Marlins who got a letter from her with them to settle that year's baseball strike so that Jennifer could watch her favorite player, left fielder Jeff Conine. Conine responded by promising the girl he would hit a home run for opening day. He delivered in dramatic fashion, slamming an eighth inning blast over the left field wall. Jeff Conine hit a home run for Jennifer and gave her the ball back. She was as happy as can be. By the spring of 1995, the poignant saga of the sick little girl and her heroic mother had become familiar to millions around the country. But that April, an anonymous tip led Florida authorities to revisit the troubling allegations of four years before. Their investigation would cast Kathy Bush's public persona in a horrific new light. The first doctor statement I took, that doctor said to me, if the child stays in the household, the child will die. By the beginning of 1995, 37-year-old Kathy Bush of Coral Springs, Florida, had gained a national reputation as a model mom. She was portrayed as a tireless advocate for health care reform and a tenacious fighter for the care of her critically ill 7-year-old daughter, Jennifer. If you had a child like Jennifer who lost her health insurance, wouldn't you move heaven and earth to do everything humanly possible to see that your child's needs were met? But that spring, a chain of events was set in motion that would turn Kathy Bush's public profile upside down and lead many to believe that the model mom might really be 
a monster. It all began in April, after a nurse at Memorial Hospital in Hollywood, Florida, where Jennifer Bush was a patient, contacted the state's child abuse hotline. The nurse alleged that Kathy Bush was deliberately injuring Jennifer by tampering with her IV and feeding lines. Kurt Navarro, a detective with the Hollywood Police Department, was dispatched to the hospital to investigate. The first physician he spoke with flatly stated that if the police didn't step in, Jennifer Bush would die. From that, who gave me that statement, from the nurse who called me from the hospital, from the other nurses, there was no doubt in my mind that the Bush had purposely injured her child. Several weeks later, Navarro presented his findings at a meeting with officials from the Florida Department of Children and Families and Assistant Broward County State's Attorney Dennis Nicewonder. My first impression was there's no way this case is going anywhere. We can't prove this in a million years. But as Nice Wonder dug deeper into the case file, already thousands of pages thick, he began to change his mind. He learned that back in 1991, nurses at Coral Springs Medical Center had lodged a similar complaint against Kathy Bush. They noticed very distinctive patterns where Jennifer would be happy and laughing and playful and acting like a normal healthy child and then when Kathy Bush would come in to visit Jennifer Jennifer would all of a sudden become sluggish uh, pale listless she would vomit and they said it was almost like clockwork now the same pattern was allegedly repeating itself at a different hospital when this investigation began in 1995, she was in critical condition in the intensive care unit with 104, 105 degree fever. I just figured something had to be done, it, no matter how long it took. From the beginning, the investigators knew that at the heart of the case was one disturbing question. Why would a loving mother try to make her daughter ill? The answer, it seemed, was already in the files. Back in 91, officials at Coral Springs Medical Center had asked Eli Neuberger, an authority on child abuse, to review the case. In my view, this kid had normal child illnesses, which were treated appropriately early on. But all of the serious illnesses that this girl had derived from the mother's actions. Kathy Bush, he concluded, suffered from Munchausen syndrome by proxy, a rare psychological disorder in which a parent deliberately makes a child ill because the parent craves attention. Munchausen syndrome by proxy is hard to get your head around, but in a certain number of these cases, and this has got to be one of them, it's not rocket science to put two and two together. After reporting his findings in 1991, Newberger assumed that action would be taken against Kathy Bush and put the case out of his mind. Five years later, he got a call from Dennis Nicewander. I was stunned to hear when the prosecutor called that by then there had been 39 surgeries, some 200 hospitalizations, because back in 1991 it was so apparent Newberger's alarm was echoed by other experts the investigators contacted. Now convinced that Jennifer was in imminent danger, they sought the go-ahead to remove her from the house, just as they would do in a typical child abuse case. But this was not a typical case, and Kathy Bush was no ordinary mom. The investigators were told that they were not to intervene unless their case was strong enough to put the well-connected mother behind bars. I mean, we have to understand that Kathy Bush knew a lot of politicians, senators, because of the health care crusade she was on. You know, you don't want to take a swing at the big bully on the block unless you're sure he's going to stay down. Over the course of the next year, the investigators painstakingly pieced together the puzzle of Jennifer Bush's medical history. What emerged, they believe, was a compelling portrait of child abuse, masked as maternal care. We're talking about numerous obscure medical conditions, coupled with mysterious feeding pump malfunctions, switched urine samples, 
levels of drugs in the system that physically could not have been there without tampering. We were looking at so many unusual factors converging at this one point, and they're always converging to Kathy Bush. To Kathy Bush and her family, however, the state's inquiry seemed more like a witch hunt than an investigation. They made a commitment, and their goal was to punish. The goal was never to protect Jennifer. At first, the family cooperated fully, giving authorities complete access to Jennifer's records. But over time, they grew more and more convinced that the state was out to get them, and that Kathy had been targeted simply for being a concerned and outspoken mother. In March 1996, Kathy testified at a Florida Senate hearing on family rights, criticizing state agencies as intrusive and overzealous. We are totally disgusted and outraged with the Department of HRS and their failure to recognize what, what has been a, the appropriate level of care for Jennifer. When I went and testified them, um, in front of the media, in front of the Senate subcommittee, for them that was the last straw. That it was, we're going to shut this woman up one way or another. And they knew the best way to get to me was to get to Jennifer. A month later, around 10.30 a.m., Kathy Bush got a call at work. Jennifer, she was told, had been taken from her second grade classroom that morning and was now in state custody. I'd rushed over to the school to see if she was still there, to see if it was true. And she was already gone. Three hours later, Kathy appeared with her husband at the Broward County Courthouse, where she was arrested for child abuse. That afternoon, Prosecutor Dennis Nicewander revealed to the press for the first time the state's theory that Kathy Bush had a rare psychological disorder known as Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Mothers in general that have this disorder are frequently able to dupe entire medical communities, including some of the times in the country. The allegations were stunning and to some justified the state's dramatic action. All of a sudden, they swooped in at school while Jennifer was in her class, picked her up, took her into state custody, and I think people's perception is the government doesn't just go in and take people's children. Others rallied around Kathy Bush, who vehemently protested her innocence. I never, ever abused Jennifer in any way, shape, or form, physically, medically, or emotionally. I think a lot of people want to give Kathy Bush the benefit of the doubt. How many parents have brought their child to the emergency room with something bizarre that the doctor can't get to the bottom of? Are they all going to get charged with child abuse? It would take a full three years for Kathy Bush to come to trial. During that time, she remained out on bond, living at home with her husband, Craig, and their two sons. She was allowed only brief contact with Jennifer who had made a complete recovery almost immediately after being taken into state custody and was now living in foster care. Meanwhile, as the trial approached, Judge Victor Tobin held a series of hearings to determine whether or not prosecutors could present evidence of Munchausen syndrome by proxy. From the start, the state had viewed Kathy Bush as a textbook case of a rare disorder. Only through this lens, they believed, could a skeptical jury understand how a mother's love could warp so horribly? It's difficult. How are they going to believe that a woman is purposely hurting her child just for a little attention? You've got to uh, convince a jury that wonderful person could be capable of such a monstrous act. Prosecutors argued that the cold facts of Jennifer Bush's medical history told only part of the story, that the abuse she suffered could not be separated from her mother's twisted psyche. We were simply saying that we wanted to give the jury a motive, and we think all of her bizarre behavior was relevant to that motive. The state painted a picture of a mother who thrived on her daughter's illnesses in ways consistent with a diagnosis of Munchausen syndrome by proxy. First, there was the attention she seemed to crave from doctors and nurses. There is a kind of eager interest to insinuate yourself into the medical community, to befriend doctors, to speak their language, to get involved in the excitement of giving care. They said she almost seemed euphoric in time of crisis, 
that when Jennifer was at her peak of critical illness and getting ready to be admitted to intensive care, Kathy Bush was beaming. Then there were the unusual problems with Jennifer's care, which prosecutors said consistently seemed to occur the day before she was scheduled to be discharged. Finally, prosecutors contended that Kathy Bush fed her need for attention by playing to the media, another behavior consistent with Munchausen syndrome by proxy. In a deposition, one nurse described Kathy as treating her daughter like a prop for the press. Someone said, oh, Kathy, there's a news crew coming up to do a story on Jennifer. And Kathy said, tell them not to come up yet, hold them off. She grabs Jennifer, throws her in her bed, takes her shirt off, hooks up all the tubes, and makes her look as sick as humanly possible, and then says, okay, now you can come in. In response, Kathy Bush's lawyers argued that the case for Munchausen syndrome by proxy was anything but clear. Munchausen syndrome by proxy means so many different things to different people and the way it can be interpreted. The disorder had only been recognized in the psychiatry for 20 years. Its symptoms are controversial. Its causes a mystery, as even the state's experts acknowledge. We really don't know what it is that motivates parents to do these things to children. We do know that there's no single personality type. The defense pointed out that Kathy Bush had never been diagnosed with the disorder. I don't believe Munchausen syndrome by proxy exists. I believe mothers harm their children, fathers harm their children. I believe nurses harm children. But I don't believe because you're a loving parent who advocates for your child that you should be labeled or branded. I agree with Kathy Bush's opinion that they shouldn't pick on me because I'm too concerned with my child. But, you know, unfortunately, some of her behavior transcended the treatment of her child. In the end, Judge Tobin ruled that Kathy Bush's public behavior was irrelevant to the case and that the state could only use the facts of Jennifer's medical history to prove her mother abused her. The judge's decision was a blow to the prosecution. In effect, it meant that the story they had now spent five years constructing, the sickening spiral of a Munchausen by proxy mom, would never reach a jury. On July 20th, 1999, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, the trial of Kathy Bush finally began, three years after she was arrested for child abuse. The press dubbed it the case of the Munchausen syndrome by proxy mom. But the jury would hear a much less sensational story. Judge Victor Tobin had ruled that the state could not use the rare and controversial disorder to explain Kathy Bush's behavior. He wanted, I think, for people to be very clear on what they had to prove. But I think he, the charge was child abuse and they had to prove child abuse not Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Okay, doctor, directly forward, sir. Prosecutors began with the testimony of nurses and doctors who had treated Jennifer, a dozen in all. They described a pattern of bizarre circumstances that seemed to coincide with Kathy Bush's presence. Equipment that mysteriously malfunctioned, tubes that were tampered with, symptoms that only the mother saw. She did seem to be the only constant factor. Craig was at work at times when things happened. The boys were at school. There were different nurses on duty. There were different doctors responsible for the case. But Kathy always was around. According to nurse Jackie Edwards, these incidents seemed to occur just before Jennifer was set to be discharged. Mrs. Bush would come out and say, she can't go home, she's just had a seizure. She just had a seizure in the room. And so we did observe the seizure, but then uh, we'd also have to report it to the physician, which then the discharges would be canceled. Prosecutors then focused on what they considered to be the most egregious of Jennifer's episodes. In 1990, when she was just three, a doctor at Coral Springs Medical Center put her on a potent anti-seizure medication called Tegretol, which at extremely high doses has been known to cause the seizures it's intended to prevent. Soon after, the doctor noticed that the levels of the drug in Jennifer's blood 
had inexplicably begun to spike upward. So the doctor put a hold on the Tegretol. And the significance of that is when the doctor put a hold on Tegretol, not only did that mean the nurses aren't allowed to give it anymore, but it wasn't even being sent up from the pharmacy. Yet Kathy still had access to the medication through Jennifer's home care. There were nurses who worked in the home who said there were bottles and bottles and bottles of Tegretol stored up in the house. For three weeks after the hold, Jennifer's Tegretol levels continued to surge into the toxic range. And that only left us with two possible scenarios to consider. And that was either one, Kathy Bush was giving that medication, or two, a nurse was intentionally over-administering the medication to the child. And the only one that had motive to do that was Kathy Bush. The defense argued that on a few occasions, Jennifer's Tegretol levels went up even when Kathy wasn't around. But they couldn't explain why the drug was even in the girl's system at all. I think the issue with Tegretol was very big in the trial. I think a lot of the jurors found this to be very suspicious. To describe another harrowing chapter in Jennifer's medical history, prosecutors called Dr. Alfredo Marciano, an infectious disease specialist at Hollywood Memorial Hospital. When the girl was seven, Marciano diagnosed her with an extremely rare bacterial infection called polymicrobial sepsis, an infection so rare that he believed it had to have been introduced from an outside source. How she survived an infection with a supposed deficient immune system, an infection of this magnitude, I have no or logical explanation. Some of the experts we consulted with say they've gone their whole career and maybe have seen one or two infections of that sort treating thousands of children in their career, yet Jennifer had numerous herself. The state's star witness was the Harvard child abuse expert who had been consulted during both investigations, Dr. Eli Neuberger. Neuberger led the jury step by step through Jennifer's medical history. I've talked about the laboratory values and the various procedures and what suggested that these were assaults, not incidents of illness. In my opinion, all this illness was induced or caused. It all was done to this girl. I think that Eli Newberger was probably one of the most compelling witnesses because he was the one who tied everything together for the state. But perhaps the state's most persuasive testimony came from Dr. Colin Rudolph, the specialist from Cincinnati who treated Jennifer immediately after she was removed from her family. Rudolph testified that Jennifer showed no signs of the illnesses that had plagued her almost her entire life. Jennifer was totally well while she was in our hospital. She had no evidence of gastrointestinal disorders. She had no seizures. She had no asthma. She had no significant problems. So that's a child's entire medical history and all the horrible suffering she was doing. It was merely coincidence that she decided to get better, go from death's bed to a healthy child in basically 24 hours. Six weeks into the trial, attorney Robert Bouchel began presenting the defense's case. Bouchel claimed that Jennifer's illnesses were genuine. It was the allegations of abuse, he said, that were manufactured. The product of rumor, speculation, and lies. The fault with the prosecutor's case is that it stamped scientific approval to gossip. The defense strategy was to go in saying, this is hocus pocus. You don't have a single person to see her do anything. You don't have a single person who can say she was definitely abusing the child. Bouchelle argued that nurses from two different hospitals had conspired with state authorities to frame his client. Kathy Bush was an advocate for health care for children and she undertook that cause. Uh, and her thanks was this criminal charge. And in order to believe that theory, you're going to have to believe they're willing to risk Jennifer Bush's life just to get back at Kathy Bush. Throughout the trial, Bushell had hammered away at the state's witnesses, especially the nurses, who had often failed to properly document what they saw, out of fear, they said, of Kathy Bush's powerful connections. 
Ma'am, you, you testified, tell me if I'm correct, on May 25th, 1990 was the day you saw Mrs. Bush inject something into Jennifer Bush's mouth? Yes. Did you chart it? Yes I or no? I did not chart that I observed Kathy giving something or doing something orally to Jenny. Now Bushell called his own witnesses, doctors and nurses who had treated Jennifer and seen no signs of abuse. So your testimony is that Jennifer Bush was eating solid foods in 1995 while she was living with the Bush family, correct? Yes. They testified that Kathy Bush was a devoted mom who was only trying to get the best possible care for her gravely ill daughter. Kathy's oldest son, 20-year-old Jason, then took the stand and offered an unequivocal defense of his mother. Describe your relationship that your mother had with Jennifer. Uh, they were best friends. They, they did anything and everything together. Is there anyone that you would allow to hurt your sister? Never. Do you have any evidence that your mother intentionally hurt Jennifer Bush? None whatsoever. The defense was now left with a final decision to make. At one time, Kathy Bush had been an effective public advocate for her daughter. Could she now be an advocate in her own defense? Kathy Bush certainly has a way about her of persuasiveness. In fact, the state was saying that's why she got away with it for so long is because she's just charming and persuasive. It's that mission and not even defined. Yet Bouchelle knew if she took the stand, it would open the door for the state to raise the specter of Munchausen syndrome by proxy. It was going so well, in our opinion, and the whole explanation of things that we successfully were able to keep out uh, would have come in through the questioning process. In the end, the defense decided it was not worth the risk. The case went to the jury without Kathy Bush's voice ever being heard. October 7th, 1999. At the Broward County Courthouse in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 42-year-old Kathy Bush waited as a jury decided her fate. It had taken her story a decade to reach this point, but throughout the question had always been the same. Did Kathy Bush intentionally make her daughter Jennifer ill? After deliberating for less than seven hours, the jury decided the answer was yes. Kathy Bush guilty of aggravated child abuse. The verdict left Bush and her family in tears. When that guilty verdict came down, it was the destruction in full of the family. No, 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 no touch the camera. Touch me, all right? Get on my face. They've broken up a beautiful family. I haven't seen my daughter since May. May of this year, I haven't seen my daughter. I talked to some of the jurors afterwards, and what they said was that they really felt that although there was no hard, fast, physical evidence, there was a lot of circumstantial stuff, and they described it as, you know, put brick on brick, and it adds up to a wall. At her sentencing hearing three months later, Kathy Bush stood before Judge Victor Tobin and declared her innocence. I never harmed my daughter physically, emotionally, psychologically, or medically. I love Jennifer with all my heart and all my soul. But the judge was not swayed. He sentenced Bush to five years in prison and five years probation. In my mind, the, the crime here was horrendous, and, but for the grace of modern medicine, uh, I don't believe Jennifer Bush would be here today. Bush's defense team immediately began preparing her appeal. Free on a pallet bond, she spent time at home with her husband Craig and their two sons. In October 2001, she relinquished her parental rights to Jennifer, rather than face another drawn-out legal battle. The deal she struck with the state barred her from any contact with her daughter, but it did allow Craig and the boys supervised visits with Jennifer twice a year. Voluntarily terminating my parental rights to Jennifer was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. But because I love her so much, and I want her to be able to go on with her life, and I want her to have a meaningful relationship with her dad and her brothers, I agreed to do it. I think Kathy Bush's decision to give up her rights was probably based on a very practical sense that she was gonna lose them anyway, and also trying to do the best thing for the rest of her family. 
Kathy Bush's appeal was denied in the spring of 2002. She was ordered to appear at the Broward County Courthouse no later than June 7th for a final hearing. Less than three weeks before that deadline, she told American Justice it was her family's future, not her own, that worried her. I'm not scared for myself. I know that I can handle whatever comes my way. I'm, I'm just afraid for my family. A family, she insisted, that the state had conspired to destroy. They spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. The state attorney's office, the attorney general office, the Department of Children and Families pulled all of their resources together to get this conviction. They know darn well I never harmed Jennifer. She accepts the consequences of the guilty verdict, but she will never, ever admit that she hurt Jennifer. She would do life in prison before she would admit that. But at the hearing on June 7th, Kathy's denials were dramatically contradicted. Before a hushed courtroom, a caseworker from the Florida Department of Children and Families read a statement on Jennifer Bush's behalf in which the teenager publicly expressed her views for the first time. Your Honor, I would like to share some thoughts about my experiences over the past 15 years of my life. The first thought I would like to share with you is the treatment from my mother, Kathy Bush. When I think of my mom these days, I get very angry inside. I think back to the times when I was little, sick in the hospital, not knowing what to do. When I first got taken away when I was eight years old, I thought it was something I did wrong, not knowing it was something worse. I thought I was the one being punished instead of my mother. It's almost been seven years, and I've been having to live the whole bunch of grief, and she's pretty much having a normal life. She showed very little forgiveness for her mother. She clearly believes that her mother did this to her. And perhaps that's the most compelling thing when it comes down to it, that the daughter feels that the mother did this. The judge agreed and ordered Kathy Bush to begin serving her sentence immediately. The 44-year-old mom was handcuffed, fingerprinted, and led away from the courthouse. Kathy Bush was sent to the Gadsden Correctional Facility in Quincy, Florida. In a series of letters, she told us that she's staying busy, leading Bible study classes, teaching literacy, and even working an off-site job as a secretary. But she added, quote, when you're innocent and sent to prison, there's not a lot of rehabilitation to be done. Meanwhile, her husband and two sons remain unwavering in their support. She never did anything to hurt me. Me being her firstborn never did anything to hurt my brother being the second. She surely wouldn't do anything to hurt my sister. And uh, I just, I, I'll believe my mom till the day I die. For those who work to put Kathy Bush behind bars, questions still linger. How did she fool the doctors? Did her husband know it was happening? And most chillingly, what could drive a loving mother to do what she did? But in the end, they remain convinced of two things. Kathy Bush had to be stopped, and her daughter's life hung in the balance. In this case, we actually had a chance to save someone's life. You know, instead of just picking up pieces later, there's actually a life to be saved in the process. And that gave it a whole new motivating force. I believe that Kathy Bush, deep in her heart, does love her daughter on it. But what she was doing was not the way you show the love.